There's no way I could have gotten out. As I sank, I lost consciousness. Well, this must be the afterlife. Louis Zamperini's courageous story is portrayed in the Hollywood movie and best-selling book, Unbroken. Was I in serious trouble? Yeah. But there's more to Louis' story. It was just unbelievable. Told in his own words. My life was completely changed ever since. Coming up next. In 1949, a group of businessmen, some pastors, invited my father, Dr. Billy Graham, to come to Los Angeles to hold a three-week campaign. Well, that three-week campaign, it turned out to be an eight-week crusade. There are problems that face us tonight that will never be solved unless we bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ and turn our life over to Him. Hundreds of people gave their lives to Jesus Christ during these eight weeks. And one of those was a man by the name of Louis Zamperini. He was an Olympian, a war hero. And it's a true story of forgiveness and the power of what Christ can do in your life. Louis Zamperini was part of the greatest generation, the generation that sacrificially fought in World War II. His steps are a little less sure at 92, his body a bit more frail, but inside, he always had the heart of a hero. In 1943, Lieutenant Zamperini was stationed in the South Pacific with one purpose in mind, to win the war as quickly as possible. I was a master bombardier on a B-24 bomber, and uh, bombing the Pacific was a big task because the, the targets were a thousand miles apart. From an airfield on the island of Funafuti, Louis and his fellow crew attacked each mission head on, always ready to load up and take off in the bomber appropriately called Superman. Our first big raid was Wake Island, well, we came in at 8,000 feet with heavy bombers and dive bombs that surprised them. We had a big mission against Nauru, just north of Australia, and we were told to lay it waste. I got my target, my shack, which I considered to be the radio shack, but actually it was their fuel supply. Smoke shot in the air, as high as we were. And so nine Japanese zeros took off. They hit us every pass because they came in so close. We shot down three zeros, but not before taking on 600 bullet holes, five cannon holes, and we just barely made it. We crash landed on Funafuti. The horrific battle left one man dead and seven others seriously wounded. With their plane badly damaged, the remaining crew members were transferred to Hawaii for reassignment. One fateful day, that reassignment came. The operation officer comes out and says, hold it. He said, uh, we just got a report that a B-25 crashed in the sea. We want you to go search for him. Well, we were assigned uh, the bomber called the Green Hornet, which was a lemon, it wasn't fit for combat. We were reluctant to take it, but we had to. As we began to search the sea, number one mortar went out, we started to drop. Then number two went out. The plane just heeled over to the left and hit the water, blew it into a big fireball. Well, as the plane sank, I felt my ears pop, but I keep on sinking, and pretty soon I feel pain in my forehead. I only had time to say, God help me, and then I lost consciousness. And then I'm conscious again. I'm confused, I couldn't figure it out. I thought, well, this must be the afterlife. I should have been dead. In fact, everyone else aboard the Green Hornet was dead 
except for the pilot, Russell Phillips, and the tail gunner, Francis McNamara. I arched my back out and popped to the surface, swallowing uh, fuel and blood. I saw a life raft drifting away from the wreckage area. I grabbed it, and uh, then we started our drift of 47 days in the South Pacific. The trio would eventually drift 2,000 miles over those 47 days, surviving on a little rainwater, a few fish, and an occasional bird. It was then and for the first time in my life that I began to pray. And I said, God, if I survive this ordeal, get back to America alive, I'll seek you and serve you. Staying alive took grit and tenacity, characteristics that had already guided Louis through a troubled youth. As a boy, Louis learned to rely on himself to fight his way through trouble. There was no place for faith. Well, I had no faith. Well, I was, you know, I went to church, but nothing ever happened. My mother would give me a dime to go into the church. I'd go down in the basement, climb out the back window and go on the merry-go-round or the roller coaster or buy a hot dog. Uh, that was uh, my typical teenage years. Fast becoming a juvenile delinquent to local police, Louis's older brother Pete urged him to change course and find a focus. The high school running track seemed to be his salvation. A natural athlete, Louis excelled to the point of setting a new world record for the high school mile. He was dubbed the Torrance Tornado, and there was even talk of a spot on the 1936 Olympic team. But that was then. Right now, Louis needed more than just a win. He needed a miracle. On their 27th day at sea, the men heard what sounded like motors in the distance. The plane came down, and we thought it was an American plane. We shot signals in the air, and it was a Japanese Sally bomber. And then we recognized the red circle after they had opened up fire on us. And then they spent 30 minutes circling and firing on us. And that's a small raft. They stayed in the raft because they were weak. I dove in the water with the sharks. Every time the shark made a pass, I'd straight on the shark, on the snoot of the nose, and the shark would take off going one way, and I would take off climbing back into the raft. Despite the enemy's persistent strafing, no one had taken a bullet. The tiny raft, however, had 48 holes. The men patched as best they could. On the 33rd day of their relentless ordeal, Sergeant Francis McNamara died. His raft mates slipped his body overboard and waited for their time to come. But on the 47th day, after a savage all-night storm, the foundering raft was lifted high on a wave. For the first time since their odyssey began, the men saw land. Before we could land on any one of the deserted islands, a Japanese patrol boat happened in the area, saw us, picked us up. We were skeletons. We couldn't stand up. Two days there, then they put us aboard a ship and said, you're going to go to the island of Kwajalein. Well, we always considered that island the execution island because all prisoners are sent there for interrogation and then executed. So we're there and put into small cells. Flies and mosquitoes, our bathroom right in the corner of the cell. Cursed at us, spitting on us. They gave us experimental injections in our veins. I'm getting dizzy, my body itches all over, and now I'm gonna pass out. They're using us for guinea pigs. And then uh, they set our day of execution. It was Louis's athletic success on the international stage seven years earlier that would now halt his execution. Through these flag-bedecked streets rides Adolf Hitler, host to the worldwide gathering of sport enthusiasts to open the 1936 Olympia. He had, in fact, earned that spot on the U.S. Olympic team at just 19 years old. He ran the last lap of his 5,000-meter race so impressively that he was congratulated by Adolf Hitler. Japan followed American athletes closer than Americans did. It would better serve Japan's purpose to send Louis Zamperini on to Japan to become a prisoner of war and to make broadcasts. That's why my life was spared. 
As a Japanese prisoner, Louis would face abuse, but he was alive, a fact that no one back home knew. The United States government classified him as killed in action. They took me on the radio, they wrote the script, and it was propaganda, and I said, I can't do it. They said, you will go to punishment camp if you don't do it. Louis was put on a train to a horrific Japanese prison camp. I was in Camp 4B in Noetsu, eating seaweed three times a day. And the only meat we got was a dog that they captured in the city. And uh, we lost, I think, 80 guys in one winter. Starvation and hard labor were not the worst of Louis' daily demons. A camp guard, aware of Louis' Olympic fame, seemed obsessed with breaking the young officer. The torture was relentless. The disciplinary officer, Sergeant Mitsushiro Watanabe, they called him the bird. When he looked at me with those big sadistic eyes, I looked away and he punched me out. Why you don't look at me? Then the next day I looked at him and he punched me out for looking at him. And so I got beaten up 10 days in a row. Now his belt was about five inches wide, half inch thick with a big a steel buckle. He took that off and hit me across the temple, knocked me to the floor, blood spurred out of my head. I was constantly being tormented by the guy. And uh, you talk about hate. I wanted to kill him, I wanted to strangle him. Louis lost nearly 100 pounds, now weighing a meager 65. And he knew time was running out. After two years of ruthless torture, Louis's fate suddenly changed. The plane flew over, they circled the building, flew away, and we thought, well, maybe the war is over. In August 1945, Japan surrendered. The Allies had won, and Louis was finally going home. And I saw my family for the first time in about three and a half, four years. The world was celebrating victory in Europe, now victory in Japan. And coming home as a soldier, you get a hero's welcome. Everybody treated me, took me out to parties and dinners, and I'm taking advantage of all this. Uh, notoriety, I mean, it was just unbelievable. He even met a beautiful Miami debutante named Cynthia Applewhite. It was love at first sight for both of them, and marriage quickly followed. On the outside, life was better for Louis. But inside, deep scars remained. Because of the bird, I had nightmares. Because of my life in prison camp and uh, resentment about many things that happened in prison camp, I had nightmares because of those things. Uh, the nightmares were every night. I couldn't get rid of it. So I went to, to the, uh, the VA hospital and uh, the psychiatrist, but it didn't help. And then one night I woke up strangling her wife instead of the bird. And that scared me, it scared her. And I got worse and worse. It didn't gradually go away, it got gradually worse. Louis was free from the physical clutches of the bird. But unbelievably, he was still in a battle. It would prove to be the greatest fight of his life. You can own this incredible story of Louis Zamperini's life on DVD as a thank you for any gift of ministry support. Call 877-567-8989 or go to billygram.tv. This double feature DVD also includes Canvas Cathedral, Billy Graham's Crisis of Faith, a deeply personal look into Graham's early ministry. It was like an internal war going on inside of his heart. He was being ripped apart. Journey with his grandson as he investigates this crisis and the pivotal moment that brought Billy Graham and Louis Zamperini together. 
take part in the ongoing work of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association through your prayers and support. For more than 50 years, Billy Graham's crusades reached millions around the world. Today, that same mission continues, led by Franklin Graham. Join us in this urgent work. Call now or go to billygram.tv. The nightmare started in prison camp. Because of the bird, I had nightmares. When this Watanabe was beating me, I'd stand there with my fist clenched. I, I wanted to grab him and strangle him. The nightmares were every night. I couldn't get rid of it. I began to drink. And, I, and I, when I'm drinking and getting drunk, I'm, I, I completely forget about my ordeals. And so that's, what, um, that's kind of a temporary comfort. It was a temporary comfort Louis began to crave. As his addiction grew, the awful irony became clear. Alcohol was now his tormenting enemy. It got gradually worse. And finally, uh, out every night drinking, and my wife got fed up with it, and she knew our marriage was ruined, and she had a little girl to take care of. And she said, that's it, I've had it until she decided to file for divorce. Cynthia was heartbroken, but seemed to have no other options until she accepted an invitation from a concerned neighbor. Young guy came over and said, oh, by the way, um, there's a young evangelist coming out to have a, a series of meetings and uh, I'm inviting you to go with me. That young evangelist was Billy Graham, not yet nationally known, this would be his first major outreach in Los Angeles. At the corner of Washington and Hill Streets in the city of Los Angeles, the largest tent ever erected for a revival meeting is now complete and is called the Canvas Cathedral. It seats 6,500 people and the tent is filled to capacity day after day. She came home speaking of this new peace and joy in her heart that she had received when she received Christ as her Savior. And she tried to witness to me, and I wanted no part of it, but she said, she, she, she had already had papers for divorce. She, because of my conversion, I'm not going to get a divorce. Well, that was good news to me. I loved my wife. She was beautiful, brilliant, and devoted. And uh, so that softened me up. Louis reluctantly went with his wife, only to storm out of the tent that first night. I said, now don't ever try to get me back to a, a place like this again. But she knew this was our only hope. And I said, okay, I'll go by one condition. When that fellow says every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm out of there. And she got me back the next day again. Thank God for that. And then it was the second night that I heard, I heard the gospel. Our scripture tonight is taken from Amos, the fourth chapter and the 12th verse. We read these words, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. And then he started quoting scripture for all have sinned and come show the glory of God. And I said, hey, I don't need, I don't need you to tell me I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And then he said a couple of unique things that really stabbed me in the heart. I do not believe that any man can solve the problems of life without Jesus Christ. There are tremendous marital problems. There are physical problems. There are financial problems. There are problems of sin and habit that cannot be solved outside the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of all of my near-death experiences, my life never passed before my eyes, ever. But when Billy Graham quoted scripture, my life did pass before my eyes. And then when he mentioned people in serious trouble almost always turn to God in prayer. Was I in serious trouble? Yeah. Did I have serious problems? Yes. And they crashed, life raft, and so forth. What do you do on the raft? You pray. What do you do in prison camp? You pray. That's all you do. You pray morning, noon, and night for 47 days, 43 days in the dungeon. Get me home alive, God, and I'll seek you. I'll serve you. And I th I'd never remembered that until Billy Graham started quoting the scriptures. Do you know Christ? 
Are you sure of it? Are you certain of it? All you have to do is let Jesus come in your heart. I started to leave the tent meeting and uh, I felt awful guilty about my life because at that time my life passed before my eyes and I saw an ugly life. Yes, I had a lot of great times, a lot of uh, great experience, a lot of escapes from death, but I still didn't like my life after the war. It was terrible. And I thought, God, what a heel. I, I, I came home alive. And there, uh, God kept his promise. I didn't keep mine. And uh, so I went forward and accepted Christ. I knew I was through getting drunk. I knew I was through smoking. And I knew I had forgiven all of my guards, including the bird. Never, bought, never dawned on me again that I hated the guy. That was the first night in all those years I never had a nightmare. And I haven't had one since. The next morning I got up and grabbed my Army New Testament. Now in the service we couldn't understand the Bible, so we just discarded the Bible. But now I found my New Testament, which was sent home in my foot locker when I was declared dead, sat under a tree and began to read. You're talking about a miracle. The first time in my life I understood what the Bible was saying. Not all of it, but I understood the plan of salvation, Christ on the cross, and tears began to roll down my face. Conversion is a miracle. Understanding the scripture is a miracle because that's proof that the Spirit of God did come into your heart. The change in Louis's heart was so radical that he began contemplating something extraordinary. He knew God was calling him to return to Japan. Not long after he accepted Christ, Louis was back in the land where his nightmares began. This time, he entered a different prison, one that housed Japanese war criminals. Well, I spoke to the 850 total, and then I gave an invitation and I said that uh, we just I'm presenting the gospel to you that Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried for three days, rose again alive. Over 50% had raised their hands. Then I saw my guards, I identified them as they walked down the aisle. Though the bird would never meet Louis, many of his former captors came forward. Well, this was quite a thrill to me to see, see these men after all these years and I know for sure now, even face to face, that the forgiveness was total. This Billy Graham thing is, is a phenomenal miracle. The way it started, the way it spread out. Hey, I'm one guy that got saved. And I've spoken to hundreds of thousands and had my testimony in papers where millions read it. One person. Think of the, the, the spider worm effect all over the world. Louis's special connection to Billy Graham lasted decades. In June 2011, he made a cross-country flight to see his old friend and take a tour of the Billy Graham Library. Thank God for Billy Graham. He's indelible in my heart and mind. The heart of the story is when I found Christ as my Savior, and that's the heart of my whole life. Oh, wow. It is nostalgic. I that Memories of the greatest day of my life, when I came to Christ, that's something you can't forget, it's indelible. Also indelible on Louis's heart were those scriptures that came alive to him in 1949. Through the years, they fed his soul. He found undeniable truths that were deeply personal. The coils of death entangled me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called to my God for help. He reached down from on high, took hold of me, and drew me out of deep waters. I'll tell you, when I read that, uh, tears came to my eyes because that's exactly what happened. The greatest question that anyone can face is, what have you done with Jesus Christ? Louis Zamprini, uh, the night that he gave his life to Jesus Christ, his life was changed. You see, he was broken, not unbroken. He was broken, spiritually broken, and his life was falling apart. And when he went forward that night, God 
took the pieces of his life and he put it back together again. And he can do the same for you. God loves you. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. God will take the pieces of your life and he'll put it back together again if you're willing to put your faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. You see, it's Jesus Christ that took your sins to the cross. He died for your sins. He was buried for your sins and God raised him to life. And if you're willing to believe by faith and trust in him and invite him into your heart, God will heal your heart. He'll forgive your sins and you can have a a new life and a new beginning. Would you like to do that? If you would, then just pray this prayer with me right now. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died in my place, that you raised him to life. And I want to invite him to come into my heart to take control from this moment on forever. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, God has answered it. He's forgiven you. He's cleansed you of all of your sins. Just like Louis Zamprini, when he came to faith in Christ, the first thing he wanted to do was a Bible. He wanted to read God's Word, and he wanted to see what God had to say to him. And when you read God's Word, it's a living book. It comes alive. Uh, I know you say, well, Franklin, I've read it before. It didn't make sense. You read it now, like Louis Zamprini said and it'll begin to make sense because you've got the Holy Spirit of God in your heart and in your life. And remember this, God loves you. There is power in the gospel to transform lives. Enjoy more inspiring stories of transformation through this exclusive double feature DVD. As a thank you for your support, you can receive this program and Canvas Cathedral, Billy Graham's Crisis of Faith a personal look into one of Billy Graham's greatest struggles. Call 877-567-8989 or go to billygram.tv. Join us through your prayers and financial support in proclaiming the good news through live events, online evangelism, the Billy Graham Library, and more. Call now or go to billygram.tv. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a supernatural... Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's Attic Bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library.